it is, uh, it's good to jump back in to this red con, ready condition. It, it's a battle term, ready condition, red con one, highest level. The reason being is we are in a spiritual battle and it's the highest level. It's not we're building up, it's we are thrust into it. When we receive Jesus Christ, we don't just become a part of the family of God, we become a part of the army of God. The whole, the whole emphasis is this is a spiritual battle. We are spiritual people. We, we live in a body, uh, we have a soul, which is our mind, our will, and our emotions. And so many people just live in their mind, their will, and emotions. And if you make decisions based on your emotions, you're gonna live an up and down, you're gonna live an inconsistent life. So we, we live our life based on spirit. We receive Christ, we were dead in our spirit, we become alive. Sin caused us to be dead. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. We were, we were dead in our hearts, in our spirit. And, and what happened? Jesus came. We celebrated it last weekend. That passion, that passion event, that holy week, Jesus lived. He died a brutal death on the cross of Calvary beaten, stripped, humiliated, died bearing our sin. God turns away. The world yells, crucify him. He died on the cross. In that moment, God turned away. The sin, my sin, your sin, the sin of the world was placed on him. And he paid the price for our sin. Now, the power of of what he did on the cross is demonstrated in that third day, in that Sunday morning, in that resurrection day. Because he lives, the sacrifice made is effective. And the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead now dwells in me and makes me alive. Amen? Where? It makes me alive in my spirit. Sure, it affects my emotions. Sure, it affects me physically but we are of spirit. Here's the problem, is we face life, we do things, and we try to work things out in the energy of our flesh, our minds. Now I know God, God's given us a, a, a mind, he's given us the ability to think and to process, and that's good. But if, if that's simply all you do, if it's not God, I surrender my thoughts, I surrender my intellect, I surrender what I think to your will. It's not my will, but thy will. We try to figure out all of our problems, we try to do it all of ourselves. we're control freaks, and we manipulate, master manipulators, to try to get things to work out the way we want them to work out. And in doing so, we'll end up being deceitful, we'll lie, We'll twist God's word, when in reality, if we surrender to God and we trust God's word, build our life on God's word, God's word works, amen. So this whole emphasis is to help us to understand we're in spiritual, we're in a spiritual conflict. We have three enemies. I know it's been a couple of weeks, but I know that you know who the enemies are. So we're gonna say them together on the count of three. One, two, three, our enemy is See, I knew you knew it. All right. It's a good thing we're going back over some of these things this morning. The, our enemy, it, it's the world, the flesh, and the devil. The world, a world system. The Bible says not to love the world, neither the things that are in the world. All that's in the world is the lust of the eyes the lust of the flesh, and pride, arrogance, the pride of life. The Bible says to walk in the Spirit so we don't fulfill the desires of the flesh. The desires of the flesh are evil, controlling. The heart is deceitful above all, sensual, rebellious. And then the Bible tells us that the enemy 
Satan comes, but for to kill, to steal, and to destroy. And, and they work in, in and out and in conjunction together. And this battle that we, that's raging, you, you stand back and you, and you think, how in the world could, there's a battle that's happening. And the fact of the matter, a lot of people just don't even acknowledge the fact that we're in a conflict. But we're in a conflict for our very souls, for our very hearts, our minds, for our families. This, this, this battle between, between spirit, between spirits, the mind of Satan warring against the mind of God in the mind of man, and then this, this whole war between the natural and the spiritual. The Bible says in Ephesians 6, Verses 10 through 15, it says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes, the tricks of the, of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. See, it's not a physical battle. It's not a natural battle. We don't win it. The weapons of our warfare, the Bible says, are not carnal, not natural, but mighty through God. Mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And so, so it's not a flesh and blood battle. It's a spirit battle. Knowing that we are in spiritual conflict, therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand firm, it says stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and put on the breastplate of righteousness and shoes for your feet having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Now, we've walked, walked through the fact we're in spiritual battle, the enemies, who our enemy is, and how we overcome the enemy, and how this, this isn't a one-time war, but how, how we gain victories, and then, boy, the flesh starts to rise up, the world starts to influence our own, our, our, our own uh, uh, the deeds of the flesh, and we get out of the spirit. Satan blindsides us, blindsides us and tries to take us out. And so we must constantly be, be prepared. Matthew chapter 6, verses 31 and through 34, and then Philippians 4, 6. Now, I want you just to see these two verses. They're, we quote them. We know them well. We preach a lot of different angles and, and emphasis from these. But I want you to see this. It says, therefore, do not be anxious. Do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat? Circle that. What shall we drink? Circle that. What shall we wear? Circle that. For the Gentiles, people who don't know God, the ungodly, they seek after these things. Your heavenly Father knows you have need of them. So stay right there for a second. Go back just a second. So eat, drink, wear. Natural. It's all natural. It's all flesh. It's all natural. Don't be anxious about those things. All right? Now, next verse. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and these things will be added to you. Don't be anxious about tomorrow. So we focus on what we're going to eat, what we're going to drink, what we're going to wear. We focus on the natural. God says, no, seek first. Focus on the spiritual. Americans, we focus on the natural. Everything's about, you know, I, I don't have many people say to me concerning you know what? I got a lot going on, but I have poured myself in, and I'm seeking first the kingdom. I, God's going to make a way. I'm trusting him. I'm leaning into him. I thank God for all he's provided for me through the armor of God, the blood of Jesus, the name of God. I thank, I'm, I'm just thankful to God. I'm saved. I thank God for the Holy Spirit. I thank God. I'm, praise God, I'm more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ who strengthens me. I don't get that a lot. I get, oh, pastor, you're not going to believe what happened. You're not going to believe what they did. You're going to believe this and do this and this and this. 
We focus on the natural and talk about the natural. We don't talk and talk and talk, and we just want to keep talking about the natural. When we should be saying, I want to talk about Jesus. I'm going to talk about all the things that he has done. Amen, Pastor Fred. That's good preaching. I think it is. All right. Philippians 4, do not be anxious. Again, do not be anxious about anything, but everything by prayer, supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Don't be anxious about anything natural. Prayer, supplication, thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Spiritual, seek the spiritual first. And when I seek the spiritual first, listen, here's what happens. Here's what happens. Then the God which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Seek the spiritual. That's where the peace that passes all understanding. It doesn't come because I talk, about, talk it to death. It comes because I pray, I'm sincere, I pour my heart, I pour my heart out to God. Are you with me on this this morning? Just a little bit of a foundation as to why the emphasis and how, how this how this how this works. Remember, 75 to 90% of all doctor visits are stress-related. That's not my statistic. You can find it. You can Google it up. It comes from stress-related. We live in a stress-filled, anxious, fearful, fearful world. So how, how are we going to overcome? Well, we're walking through this emphasis on our shoes. Paul looks at this, this gladiator type of warrior that has on this armor and all the apparatus that goes with it. And, and I, don't, I don't really believe that in his mind he was thinking, okay, you know, that this is a, a total prayer of just every day I put it on. If you do that, and I've done that and go through seasons. I got the helmet. I think it's an acknowledgement. I got the helmet on. Here's why I say that. Because I've never taken the helmet of salvation off. So whenever I put it on, if I'm saying that in the morning, okay, I'm putting on the helmet of salvation. I'm just affirming I've got a helmet of salvation on. Are you following me? Might be semantics to you. But breastplate of righteousness I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. He who knew no sin became sin, that I might become righteous. Righteousness covers. It covers my mind, my heart. My heart, what's my heart? It represents my mind and my emotions. I'm covered by it. The shoes are that stability, something that gets me a, gives me a grip that I'm able to stand because it said doing all to stand, keep standing. We can't do that if you've got slick shoes on. You've got to have something that's got some grip to it. Shoes today are more fashion than function, but the, 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 the warrior shoes are that of, of function. It's the gospel of peace. Now, what does that mean, gospel of peace? Well, we're looking at it in, in, in four different avenues. And the first was this, it is victory comes through peace. And that peace starts with peace, peace with God. Do you know Jesus Christ? Have you received him? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But in while I was yet a sinner, Christ Jesus died for me. And now, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will open up, I'll come in. Be fellowship, peace, peace with God. See, it's what the cross, it's what last week, the cross, Jesus dying on the cross. And when the sin of the world was placed upon him, and when he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God turns away. And what happened? When, when, when he takes the sins of the world, he goes through this, and then he declares, it is finished. I've, I've done. I've, I've made the sacrifice. I paid the price. What happened? The curtain that separated the holy place from the holy of holies, where the Ark of the Covenant was at, that curtain, big, thick, tall, 
was literally shredded. Which meant God's presence no longer dwells behind a curtain. But he's broken down that middle wall of petition. Listen to this, Ephesians 2, 14 through 16. For he himself is our peace who made us both one and has broken down in his flesh, broke down the dividing wall of hostility. No longer separation. He abolished it, destroyed it. The Bible says this in Romans 5, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. See, Jesus established when he died on the cross, when he completed the work, the the curtain is destroyed. And so, because of that, I can now enter boldly into the throne room. I, can, I have a relationship. Jesus didn't die on the cross so I can have a denomination. I'm not against denomination, but he didn't die on the cross so I can have a denomination. He didn't die on the cross so I might have religion. He died on the cross so I could have a personal relationship. Do you know what all that was? It was peace. God saying, Jesus coming, Jesus dying. His resurrection. God's God's saying peace. You don't get it. Let me show you. Here it is. I'm an enemy of God. Was. Before Christ, we don't want God. We don't want to obey God. We don't want to do God. Oh, we want blessings, yeah, but, but there's no sense of surrender, love, worship. We're enemies of God. Sin causes us to be enemies of God. And while we're enemies, God says, no, no, peace. I want to reconcile this thing. I want to make peace with you. Well, I'm the enemy. I'm the one who offended God. Shouldn't I be the one going to him to make peace? But no, God initiates peacemaking. God made peace. I, he says, I want peace. And so he initiates peace. He says, listen, I'm not mad. Jesus, I, coming to this earth, I'm not mad. Peace. When Jesus was born, peace on earth, goodwill toward men. And so this peace with God, this relationship with God, it, rec- it signifies, it helps us to understand God is not angry. God is not mean, sadistic. God is for us. God loves us. God so loved the world so much he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes him would not perish, wouldn't go to hell, but have everlasting life in heaven. Amen. Peace with with God. And so all peace, lasting peace, starts with knowing him. So I ask you, do you know him? I'm not asking if you're a Baptist, a Lutheran, a Methodist, Episcopalian, Presbyterian, Pentecostal, Jewish, you name it. I'm not asking. I'm asking, do you have peace with God? Have you received Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior, and are you following after him with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength? Man, thank God for that opportunity. Thank God I know him today. Amen? Know him. It's, it's, a, it's a word of intimacy. Paul said that I may know him. Well, that peace, peace with God leads to the peace of God. And here's, here's what he said. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you, not as the world gives. The world's peace, fleeting. The world's peace is, is a high. It's a, you know, getting buzzed. It's a moment. And you get buzzed so long, and then you can't get that buzz anymore. And you've got to do more. And you spend your whole life trying to get what you once had. It's not a peace like the world gives. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. His peace, there's no fear. Isaiah 26.3 says, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon you. There's that spiritual engagement. I'm, I'm connecting with him. 
And then, of course, Philippians 4, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by, by prayer. Now, how do we do this? How do we do this? How do we have this peace of God? Now, listen. 2 Corinthians 10, 5. We destroy arguments and every lofty, rebellious attitude, every lofty opinion that's raised against the knowledge of God. Now, here it is. And take thought, and take every thought captive to obey Christ. A, a, a peace-filled life a spiritually engaged life is one that is working. It's a battle. It's a day in, day out. It's a battle to bring every thought captive. Most people live their life like this. Whatever comes in their brain, whatever is bugging them, they play out all the scenarios. And, and so something bad, I mean, people play out the worst case scenario Finance, the worst case scenario of relationship, the worst case scenario at work, the worst case scenario about my health. There's no check. There's no bringing every thought captive. And so there's no peace. There's anxiety. There's fear. Why? Because we're letting the video run. If I'm watching something on TV and I don't like it and I don't want to watch it, what do I do? I change the channel. We don't do that spiritually with our brains. We need to change the channel. We're just running this out. Change the channel. Finally, whatsoever is good, pure, just, honest. If there be any virtue, if there be any good thing, think on these things. Oh, no, I want to think. I'm going to do this. this. No, think. Redirecting. What do I love? What does God love? So we bring every thought captive. And that's the battle. We grab a hold. I'm not going to allow that. That's not going to happen. I've, I've shared with you for years. I share with these sports teams when I speak to them. You want to change your life? Change the way you think. Learn how, to, learn how to bring thoughts captive. What do we do? Well, we walk through this real quick. Stay close. Devotional time. Quiet time. Prayer. Word. Worship. We spend time with him. It's relational things. It's not It's not duty. It's not just going through a formula, but we stay close. We stay close. Liz and I, we stay close. We make time, put emphasis, effort to be together, do things together. We, when we're together, we talk. We talk. We laugh. You, got, you spend time, intentional time, you know, we live in a world that says, well, I don't really have quality time, so, uh, or qu- a lot of qu- a quantity of time, but I have quality time. You, you, you need to spend some quantity of time. You need to learn to spend extended time. Hello? It's it stay close, stay close t- to him. Uh, the second thing is this, is stay clean. Stay clean. Search me, God. Know my heart, my thoughts. I got to constantly pray that because, man, my heart's deceitful above all. I, I just can't give in to it. Lord, I want to keep your spotlight. I want to keep your Holy Spirit. I want to stay full of your spirit. I want to stay full. Convict me. Help me not get away. I get away, I'll start, I'll start giving in to my thoughts. No, Lord, you control my thoughts. And so I stay close and I stay, I stay clean if we confess our sin. I stay under authority. You know, we're rebellious by nature. People don't want anybody to tell them what to do. You're not going to tell me what to do, preacher. You're not going to tell me. Nobody in this town is going to tell me. I won't do what I want to do. I don't care what they say. That's rebellion. And, and there's no blessing in that. Well, what's good? You know, do you know who I am? Do you know? There's no blessing. We'll find out who you are when you act like that, but there's still no blessing. Uh, this is this this authority thing. Some of you probably have a problem that I even say that. Let me let me say it this way: It's a lordship thing. You want to go to heaven, you just don't want to have a lord. And the blessings of God don't work that way. We want the blessings of God without walking in the obedience of God, and it doesn't work. 
We want the blessing of God, and we want to do our own thing. No, it's a lordship. Lord, your Savior, and Lord, you're calling the shots. You're in control. Stay calm. We'll come back to that in just a second. Stay teachable. Teachable. Do you love to learn? Do you, do you still, are you still learning? You know, it's the craziest thing. I've been doing this a lot of years. I am learning more today than I've ever learned before in my life. And, I, and sometimes I think, how, did, how, how have I done this? How have I lived these 45 years here on earth and not known that? It's a, it's a thing of humility, you know. I'll say it one more time. It's what you learn after you know everything that's really important. Amen. Stay humble. God resists the proud, but he gives more grace, more grace to, to the humble. Amen? Now, let me, uh, let me close out these few minutes with this, with this idea of uh, peace of God or peace with God, this peace of God, these statements bringing thoughts captive, staying close to live in peace. And, and we preach those in great detail. You can go back and, and listen and, and hear. Let me talk to you about this, this emphasis today, peacemaking. So I've got on the gospel of peace, and it's about having peace with God. I know him. It's about having the peace of God. I'm not filled with anxiousness and fear and anxiety I'm, I'm living a life of faith. Fear tries to undermine my faith. But I, I, I'm choosing faith over fear. I'm standing on the Word of God. I'm, I'm meditating. I, I'm memorizing. I, 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 the Word of God, it's near me. It's in my mouth. I'm speaking, standing. And then, then, then comes this, peacemaking. And let me say peacemaking slash peacekeeping. Peacemaking and, um, and peacekeeping. Are you a peacemaker? Are you always at odds? Is, is, is there someone that is always mad at you? Now, I understand in leadership there's some times, you know, and they say if you want everybody to be happy with you, you know, then sell ice cream. I'm sure someone would be opposed to ice cream that is somehow bad. So I don't think you could even have peace there. But what I'm saying is, are you, are you one that strives to have peace? Or is your life full of conflict? And it just seems no matter what you do, you live in conflict. Now, there are times that, that we say things, do things, or people say things, do things, and we get, we get injured, we get hurt. And then there's, there's some catastrophic type things that can happen in our life. Betrayal. And being lied about. And, and they're probably in this, in this place, there's probably people here that have been betrayed in, in business and lost tens, hundreds, a thousand dollars, millions of dollars. Uh, there's people that uh, have been betrayed in, in marriage. Uh, friends that have turned their back on you or have, have caused injury because of gossip. There's all kinds of, of things that happen in life. Some are worse than others. You've heard me liken it into this. Sometimes people go through things, and it's like when I was a kid and growing up in southwest Missouri, we had, we had blackberry briars, and, and, and a blackberry briar, we'd be out in the woods and be squirrel hunting, um, and, and, and you're walking through, and a, there'd be a blackberry briar, and, and one, you'd get it on your face, or it'd get you on your arm, and, and you're like, you pull that out, and, and it's like, I can't, man, that stung, that hurt. And there might even be a little blood spot that comes there. 
but you brush it off and you don't worry about it. It just got you. There might be a time that you're out in the woods or you're hiking and you take a fall down a ravine and, and you bust your leg open on a rock. And when you do, man, it's, it's, it's like, wow, I, I, need to get, I need to get to the doctor. And you go and you get it cleaned out. And uh, you know how that nurse comes in and looks at it. And, uh, and it, she kind of has that glean on her face and a brush. And she just starts doing that on it. That's how I remember it as a kid anyway. Um, but they clean that out. What are they doing? They're getting the dirt out. They're cleaning it out so it doesn't get infected. And then they stitch it up. Because if it gets infected, and it can lead to more serious problems. And then if you really, it continues to go and go and go and go, then what happens? You get gangrene. You, you got some serious, you maybe have a life-threatening problem. Same thing happens in life. Hurts come. Sometimes it's a stick. You take it, you brush it off, you don't worry about it. Sometimes it's, it's so deep. And you know, you know what it is. You've experienced it. I've mentioned a few. So how do, we, how do we have peace? Well, let me, let me, let me mention this. <clears throat> this whole idea of forgiveness and being a peacemaker and initiating, and, and especially when it comes to family and when it, when it, comes, when it comes to church, Listen to these scriptures. Mark 9, verse 50. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourself. Salt that preserves. It's a sense of God here. And then what's it say? That saltiness, and then be at peace with one another. Matthew 5, 23 and 24 so if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go and first be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. If you remember your brother has, they got something against me. It's not that I got something against them. They got something against me and I want to get it, get it right. The Bible says this in Matthew 5, 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Hebrews 12, strive for peace with everyone and the holiness, and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Strive for peace with everyone. In context, there's striving for peace and then and for the holiness, for living holy. Isn't that interesting? Peace with others and holiness in the same phrase, going, going together. There's no way I can go through this in its entirety today. But I want to give you a few thoughts about why we don't get along. Why we don't go to someone and ask them to forgive us. And why we have a hard time forgiving people whenever they, whenever they ask us to forgive us. And here's what, here's what happens most of the time. That conversation doesn't happen. But on both sides, people just talk. And they talk. You know what they did? I can't believe that preacher did this. Can't believe he did that. Can't believe she did that. Can't believe they did that. Can't believe they did that. I mean, they're just, and they tell everyone, which that's gossip, sin in itself. Because the Bible doesn't say go tell everybody. The Bible says talk to them. Talk to one another. And, and, and so this whole idea of why we, why we don't get along, and it's this. In a nutshell, it's pride. We have a hard time saying, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Will you please forgive me? And then we have a hard time with this. I accept your apology. I forgive you. And then we do this. We say, 
I'm sorry, will you forgive me? And we continue to talk, and we say, and yes, I accept your apology, and continue to talk. We never, we never settle anything. I have people talk to me about things, that, and they say, I've forgiven them, and I'm over this, and it happened 5, 10, 15 years ago, and they're still talking about it. Why? Hello? This whole idea of, of peacemaking, there's got to be a commitment to it. There has to be. You have to value. God values it, therefore I value it. I'm committed to it. There has to be a right understanding. Two misconceptions. One, peacemaking is not avoiding a problem. It's not acting like there's not a problem. And peacemaking is not just appeasing another person. If you appease another person, I promise you, you're going to become resentful. So it's not about appeasing, but it's about being authentic. It's about valuing it because this is who God is. It is what God, it is what God does. You know, one of the steps in, in keeping the, the peace of God, it comes from Ephesians 4, 26, where it says, be angry and do not let sin go down on your anger and give no opportunity. Anger gives opportunity. Let me go to the end of the verse. In verse 31, it says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. And then it says, be kind and tenderhearted, forgiving one another just as Christ forgave you. So that hurt, that's bitterness. We get hurt, we get the gas. If we don't get it clean, it turns into, it turns into wrath, slow, slow burning. It turns into anger, it bursts forth. It turns into clamor, talking, just talking, talking, talking. I'm just so angry, I'm just, and then it turns into slander, evil speaking. I can't believe I married you. I can't believe you, you shouldn't do this. Do you know who you, and we just start railing and saying things that, we can't get back. And the Bible says, don't do that. Be kind, tender hearted, forgiving, just as God in Christ for, forgave you. Matthew 6, the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive. Verses 14 and 15, if you forgive men not their trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you. But if you forgive, your heavenly Father will forgive you. I mentioned this a few weeks ago, and I heard it back from several, and then people mentioned things to Liz and other staff, uh, and, and staff, when I made this declaration, who's the most influential person in your life? It's the person you're unwilling to forgive. The most influential person in your life is the person that you're angry at, that you're allowing to rent space in your brain for free. How do you forgive? How do you forgive? How do you forgive when someone doesn't even ask you to forgive? You say, I forgive. You tell God, I forgive. I release that person. How do you forgive if someone dies and you never had an opportunity to talk to them about it? I forgive. I forgive you. Well, I don't feel it. Doesn't matter. It's not based on your feeling. This is, this is a righteous, this is a holy decision. I've had people, I, I have, I've had a situation in my life, it took me years of doing this before I ever felt forgiveness. But I would say, I forgive. Lord, I release them. God, I forgive. I go to bed, it'd come to mind, i get angry. I'd wake up in the morning, be on my mind, and get angry. i say, God, I forgive. And for years, every day, I would say, I forgive. I release them. I forgive. Here's what I know. Right decisions will eventually produce right emotions. But right emotions don't always produce right decisions. And so you continue to release. You're not doing it for them. You know that, don't you? You're doing it for you. Think about this. I don't have time to to go in, into this in much detail at all, but Jacob and Esau is one of the 
best stories of forgiveness that you'll find. Jacob was a deceiver. His brother's been out hunting, and he comes home, and he's hungry. <laughs> and he says, hey, I'll sell you. I'll, he'd made some soup. He said, I'll sell you both the soup if you'll give me your birthright. Jacob was born second. Esau was born first. He wanted the blessing that comes with being the first child, first male born. And so, I'll sell this to you. Well, number one, he's a lousy brother because no brother would sell a bowl of soup. If my brother's hungry, you don't sell it to him. You give it to him. He deceived Esau. He deceived his dad. He has to run for his life. He has a whole lot. He, 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 he decides after years and years and years living in exile and away, maybe his brother's died or I just need to go. So he divided his family into two parts, and he said, you guys go ahead. And his idea was, okay, I'll divide them in two parts so if one of the groups get killed, at least I'll have some family left. But I'm going to stay behind. Talk about a coward. But when he stayed behind, he had that experience with God where he wrestled with God. And God touched him. And here was his words. He goes, I mean, it was all an all night, and God got a hold of this deceiver, worthless brother, Jacob. And he said this. He said, uh, I've seen the face of God. And God touched him. He walked with a limp from that point in his hip. But here's what happened. As soon as God touched him, he ran to the front. No longer did he want his family going first to meet Esau. He went first. It's interesting. When he got a touch from God, he knew he needed to make things right with his brother. I think maybe the reason a lot of people don't make things right, there's no touch of God on you. I know that sounds harsh. There's, there's no experience with God. There's no touching the Lord. Because when you touch him, when you touch God and he's touched you, you, you want to make things right. So maybe we're so nominal and maybe we're so carnal that we can just live in our in our bitterness, anger, and unforgiveness. I, I don't know. I'm not trying to be harsh. I'm just trying to figure out why people, everybody's at odds all the time. And let me tell you something else. This thing started at home. And it's easy to make things right with people you don't know, but it starts with your husband and with your wife and with your kids and with your mom and your dad. It starts there. I'm going to tell you something. Jacob and Esau, Jacob went to him, and, and he had 550 animals, and Esau said, I don't need those animals. And Jacob said, oh, I want you to have them. I've got plenty. All of a sudden, the man who wanted to be first and wanted to have everything, he didn't even care about giving his stuff away. He, I mean, he touched God. He was surrendered. And they made peace. Now, Esau said, why don't you come with me? And Jacob said, no. It wasn't a situation where they were going to be able to live life together, but they made peace so that when their daddy died, they were able to go to the funeral and be together and there not be a scene. God help us to touch him so we have in our heart, he's forgiven me. I can forgive others. Because peacekeeping and peacemaking really sets me free. It may cost you something. Oh, it's going to cost you your pride. But Jacob walked with a, a limp. He wouldn't exchange anything for the peace because you know you're a peacekeeper and you know you're a peacemaker. You know how? You know how you know? You're at peace. You're at peace. Amen. Peace is far more important than being right. Liz, join me. Think about this. When Jesus was on the cross in those first three hours, he said this, Father, forgive them. Forgive them. They know not what they do. You with me? All right. They, they were their triumphal entry. They were their, they jeered, they mocked. 
They yelled, crucify him, give us Barabbas. And Jesus on the cross, what did he say? Father, forgive them. Now, now I want you to watch this. 50 days later, he showed himself alive 40 days, then 10 days till the day of Pentecost. 50 days after he declares, Father, forgive them. Here's what he did. He poured out the Holy Spirit. The New Testament church is birthed. 120 people. The people in town came and they said, what's going on? And Peter stood and preached the gospel. Who was he preaching the gospel to? The same people that crucified him, crucified Jesus. See, God, we might not always have reconciliation. We can always have peace. And as much as it depends on us, the Bible says we're to have peace. But God goes a step beyond. He initiates not only peace. I'm the one who offended him, and he's the one who initiates peace with me. All right? He extends it. And not only does he make peace, he reconciles. We come together. He didn't hold a grudge. He's not mad. The disciples, they weren't mad. They, Peter said, you're the ones that crucified him, but if you'll repent and be baptized, you'll be saved. <laughs> they didn't withhold the gospel. They didn't say, get out of here. We're going to take the gospel to the rest of the world. No, they preached. He's a peacemaker, and he's a reconciler. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I'm so glad you joined us today for Island Church Online. If you made a decision in your heart to follow Christ today, please let us know. You can text the word NEXT to 251-244-2030, where we'll send you some free digital resources and get you started in your journey of faith in Christ. This also gives us an opportunity to celebrate with you and pray for you. To give toward the ministry of this house, go to the islandchurch.tv slash give. Your gifts are what make this possible. We're so glad that you made the Island Church your home for Sunday worship today. And my prayer is that your year will be full of God's grace and blessings as you follow after Him.